chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only unique son. Fooled you there, Mr. D. Dot. <laughs> his only unique son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I want to use that as the basis for this simple statement that I would attempt to make tonight. I would ask us to bow our heads as we ask God's blessings upon this effort. Heavenly Father, as we come to Thee, we ask that You would help all of us here to conduct ourselves, as I know we shall, by Your help and Your grace in the way that You would desire that we do so. That every word may be for Thy glory, that we may say only what You would desire in the way that You would desire it. And I'll ask it all in the holy and the precious name of Jesus. And everyone said that are Christians, amen and amen. There is no Christian that will say that God wrote the Bible. God did not write the Bible. To be frank with you, the only thing that I know of that God did write was the Ten Commandments on stone for Moses. That was kept, the Decalogue, in the Ark of the Covenant for many, many centuries. But God never wrote the Word of God, the Bible. Man wrote it. The Bible meaning a library of books. Man wrote it as man was, according to Simon Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Peter said, holy men of old wrote as they were moved upon, breathed upon by God to write that which came from God. God used their personalities. He used their character. He used their consecration to Him. He even used their idiosyncrasies at times. But he used men so that his great plan for this planet, for all of humanity, could be placed in man's simple words so that man could comprehend it and man could understand it. There is no book on the face of the earth that has had the textual criticism that this book has had. I, I sort of feel insignificant when I stand here attempting to speak about the Bible, when I realize that some of the world's most eminent scholars have critically looked at every single text over and over and over again, sparing no expense, no time, no effort to ascertain if it was what it said it was. I have read the Bible through many, many, many times. And others such as I have read it many more times, much more educated than I could ever be, understanding both Hebrew and Greek. The first passages of the Bible were written about 3,500 years ago. To my knowledge, it is the oldest book of revelation on the face of the entire earth. We believe that Moses wrote what is called the Pentateuch, those first five books, with the exception possibly of the last few verses in Deuteronomy. And he could have even written that because we believe that God, and I know Islam believes, that God is so powerful that he could have revealed to Moses exactly how he would die and exactly how that his funeral would be conducted, that would have been no problem for God. But whether he wrote it or whether Joshua wrote it, it was written about 3,500 years ago. And the entirety of the Word of God, as so many of you know, was written by about 40 men over a space and period of time of about sixteen to 1,800 years, with the last book being written roughly 100 years after the death and the 
resurrection and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ written by the Apostle John. Now, it has been critically looked at more so, as I mentioned, than any book on the face of the earth. It is very interesting to note that Yusuf Ali, in his widely used English translation of the Koran, twice cites Sir Frederick Kenyon as a renowned authority. Kenyon, formerly the principal curator of the British Museum, was one of the world's greatest authorities on textual criticism of ancient works. I want to say that again. Kenyon was one of the world's greatest authorities on textual criticism of ancient works. Concerning the textual reliability of the Bible, he concluded that the Christian can take the whole Bible in his hand and say without fear or hesitation that he holds in his hand the true Word of God. Concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, Harvard professor Simon Greenleaf, who together with Supreme Court Justice Joseph Story, was credited with the rise of the Harvard Law School to its eminent position. He abandoned his agnosticism only after months of careful study and heart searching, recognized as America's greatest authority on legal evidence. Greenleaf found himself logically forced to conclude after lengthy and critical examination that the literal and historical death, burial, and resurrection of Christ as the Son of God in payment of our sins was established by undeniable and overwhelming evidence. One of the most brilliant legal minds on the face of the earth. In full agreement, Professor Thomas Arnold, who holds or held the chair of modern history at Oxford wrote. He said, I have been used for many years to study the histories of other times and to examine the weight and the evidence of those who have written about them. And I know of no one fact in the history of mankind which is proved by better and fuller evidence of every sort to the understanding of a fair inquirer than the great sign which God has given us that Jesus Christ died and rose again from the dead, which is proclaimed in the Word of God. No man ever said that he would die and come back from the dead as Jesus Christ did. Now, some mention about the many versions of the Bible. Really, that's an incorrect statement. There is only one version of the Bible. There are many translations. Our scholars argue constantly over varied translations. King James Version, as we use that term, as I've mentioned incorrectly, is really a translation. Others have been put out. They were critical of the King James. Even to the point of laboring incessantly to derive the Old Testament from the Hebrew in which it was written, minus a few verses in Aramaic, and the New Testament in Greek. Translations, some are incorrect, we think. I personally like the King James. However, the Koran has been translated as well into many languages, 